Hey everyone, happy Friday and welcome back to Trader Tales. This is our first episode of a new season and I couldn't be more excited to be back. And joining me for our inaugural season opener, we've got Ajay Johnny. He is managing partner at Single A Capital. So great to see you, Ajay. Thank you. Nice to see you again. And I appreciate being first. It's an honor. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming on because uh, just to give a little teaser of what we're going to be talking about today, when you and I were in our uh, pre-show chat, you were sharing so many great insights. So the honor is mine. I can't wait to uh, share your insights with the audience today, not only on the broad market and signals that you look at for your, your buy switch of when to be in, when to be out, but really how you've had success holding big winners and when to make the determination of when you should hold on for a bigger move or just uh, throw in the towel, take your gain and not try to sit around uh, if the stock's going to pull back in. So I think a lot of really great actionable insights to come. So I'm really looking forward to it. So how about let's let's jump right in. Sure, absolutely. OK, so let's start with the current market. And I guess taking a step back, it's been a pretty tricky a year and a half plus really for growth investors. And I know you are a can slim style trader. So uh, typically focused on those big growth winners. And uh, for a long while, we've seen quite a drought on that front. Uh, what are you looking at in the market right now in terms of how aggressive or conservative you should be in the market and uh, taking the lead from, from the NASDAQ and looking at those technical signals for clues? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the big challenge is that if you go back, whether you go back a month, six months, nine months, a year, NASDAQ is almost exactly unchanged. The same with the S&P, but around a wide range. And typically for our style of investing, a, a wide trading range is one of the most difficult because we tend to buy on strength, or at least I tend to buy on strength. And then obviously, you know, we have stop losses in place, which often get triggered on weakness. So in many ways, last year's market was easier because it was pretty much downhill all the way. And so cash was easy to hold, you know, since the end of 2021, uh, my average cash balance has been 90%. So that has definitely helped. But, um, you know, every once in a while, we, we find something we like, we try it. And more often than not, over the past year and several months, we've been, you know, stopped out of what we tried. So uh, I think the key is for people to to realize what environment we're in and play accordingly. So it's definitely not yet the time to, to really step on the gas. But if you're able to step into things that work, then there's nothing wrong. I mean, the market has stopped going down, uh, at least for now. Um, and, you know, it, it, I'm not the first to notice. You know, the market looks like it's potentially shaping up a reasonably healthy cup and handle. Yeah, exactly. So uh, some potential brewing there. But with the high cash amounts that you said you've had, what has really helped you remain that patient? Is it your experience with past market cycles and just knowing really where your sweet spot is? Because it seems like a number of the investors that I talk to are trying to get more aggressive now in this in this 2023 market you know we're all ready for the for the bear market to be over right it's so hard it's so hard to be patient we know what good times look like but i guess is that what you're leaning on that you you know what those good times are and you've been through market cycles and and seen all these different conditions before yeah well i, I think the you know the bear market that we had was pretty much average or, you know, if you go back 100 years uh, and study what the depth and length of a bear market is, it was almost exactly average. Uh, if we were to set a new low from this point forward, this would be one of the five worst from a time perspective. Um, so, you know, I look at a lot of analogs. I compare current, you know, the downtrend and the behavior afterwards to previous cycles. And believe it or not, the, the closest match 
is through the bottom, if you look at the bottom in either October of 1987 or December of 1987, and you compare how the market has evolved since then, they're almost identical. Now I'm looking at the S&P in that case on both, both indices. And there are some similarities. So, you know, obviously in 87, the crash happened very quickly. Here, this took a little bit longer, but growth stocks corrected, you know, very similar amounts, 40 to 70%, sometimes even more. And then after that, it was a grinding, grinding up move that took a while. I think it wasn't until 1989 that the S&P mm-hmm. made it back near its all-time high. And then obviously in, in the summer of 1990, we started another bear market from roughly the same levels that we were in 87. So this market is behaving similar to that. During that period from 19, 1988 on, the Fed was also hiking rates uh, fairly aggressively um, to contra- you know, contain a, a burst of inflation, which is similar to what we've had now. So there are some similarities, but you know, I, I like to say analogs work until they don't. So yeah. um, you know, potentially the low is in. It's been you know, six months since we, we saw the lows. Um, there, there are a few markets where it took longer than six months and then we eventually rolled over, but not many. Mm-hmm. Well, I love looking at these uh, historical precedents and uh, seeing what might apply to today, what clues we could get uh, for current conditions. Uh, history doesn't exactly repeat, but a lot of times it does rhyme. So I totally agree with you. Uh, but you got to take it with a grain of salt, as you said. Uh, but let's take a look uh, back at today. And I want to talk to you more, Ajay, about. Mm-hmm your buy signals for the market because um, at Investors Business Daily and uh, with IB founder Bill O'Neill, we talk about follow through days as a potential signal for a market rally. They don't always work, but every strong market begins with a follow through day. But there are a lot of nuances in trying to figure out how much market exposure one should have or whether to have a a quote unquote buy signal switched on. So what does that exactly look like for you? Well, so for many years, I used the follow through system to to guide me in terms of when I would, you know, start buying or not buying. And then several years ago, I did a study of every follow through day going back to 1927. So Bloomberg has data on You know, the S&P started, I think, in 1953 or 1957. And before that, there was something called the Cowles Index. And they've kind of merged those two. So they have a a history going back to 1927. And then obviously, Market Smith has history on the Dow even prior to that. And I noticed that uh, one thing about powerful follow through days that worked, uh, very few of them, you know, most of them very quickly scaled the 50 day. So if you had a follow through day and you were way under the 50 day, chances are that the rally would peter out at some point and then either roll over the new lows or you would need to set up at a higher level before you finally got that bull market going. And eventually what I settled on as, you know, what I call my buy switch, I use three components. So I use for the NASDAQ, I use the 50 day and the 21 day. So the index has to be above both of those. And then for a while, I used to use the IBD 50, and that had to be above the 21 day. And now I've replaced the IBD 50 with a custom index of what I think are the growth leaders. Uh, So my liquidity threshold was a little bit higher. Everything has to have big sales and earnings, but you can use the IBD 50 just as well. And so basically, if you have the IBD 50 above the 21 day and NASDAQ above both 21 and 50, that's when the buy window is open. So that allows me to buy. And then the question is, is there anything to buy? And then how long do you, do you start to scale in once the window opens? So the, the deeper the correction, the longer the window uh, stays open for me. You know, Even if the window is open for, say, two, three months at a time, I don't want to be waiting two or three months to get into right. stocks because typically you know, the, the leaders are going to be up and out early. Mm-hmm. So if it's a shallower cor- correction, generally within two or three weeks, you want to be in. 
to what you're going to buy. Otherwise, you have to wait for the for the next opportunity. But if, given what we've had in 2022 and the first part of 2023, I think you know once the buy window opens, I think you know nine to 15 weeks is reasonable because that gets you through an earnings cycle. Hopefully, we'll see some powerful gaps. Um, and you know we we need fresh merchandise. The the other interesting parallel to 1988. So the IPO market dried up. And so the leader of the 88 to 90, you know, semi bull market, the leaders were the old leaders that were coming off bottoming basis. There wasn't a lot of very fresh merchandise. And I think uh, many of us see the same challenge. Yes, right now. exactly. With all the mega cap stocks. Yeah. Those are those are sort of leading the indexes higher. Okay, so using all of your criteria, let's take a look at the Nasdaq now. So did your uh, most recent buy signal turn on on 316 when we saw the Nasdaq get above its uh 21 day and 50 day line. I guess the caveat then is you know, was your uh, custom index of leaders yeah. also doing the same. That's roughly the date that it came on. And actually intraday today when the NASDAQ was down, I think it as low as it, it may have been down 60 basis points or something like that. The buy window technically shut, but obviously by the end of the day, we came back. And so NASDAQ was above the 21 day again. Yeah, that's what I was also going to ask you. So um, if the buy window opens, when all the criteria is met, it just takes one to shut it off completely or for you to scale back. And if that's the buy window side, then how does that impact your profit taking? Or is that a different, that's the different set of rules on the profit taking side? Yeah, the, the buy window closing just stops me from uh, taking new trades. What I already have on, I have different rules that I manage the positions and I wouldn't scale back just because the buy window is, is open. And I think I sent you a chart. You'll see when you put it up, the buy window, um, you know, it's not perfect, but it tends to do a reasonably good job of keeping you out of the really bad market markets. But when the market's, you know, in an uptrend, it'll keep you in for most of it, or at least keep the window open. Yeah, so we have here the chart that you're referring to. So this is the NASDAQ composite versus the buy window. So in orange, that's when the buy window is open. So yeah, this this system looks like it enables you to ride the moves higher and avoid uh, some pretty nasty declines. But what about the 50 day and 21 day lines being in an uptrend? Is that something that you need or just the, the price action needs to be above those? Just, just the price action needs to be above it. Obviously, you know, when they get into alignment and everything's pointing up, uh, you know, the, you can feel the power building, but I don't need them to be in an uptrend. I just need the index to be above them. Fantastic. All right. So that seems like, uh, you know, a, a set of rules that you've tested on the buy side. So good to know that that's where we stand on that. But now let's talk about handling big winners. What in your view, I know we're, there's gonna be a lot to unpack here, but what in your view makes the difference between finding a big winner and handling it well? Well, when I, when I first started uh, doing cancel them exclusively, which was 10 years ago, I, I tried to hold everything. I assumed that everything I bought was, you know, going to be the next thing since sliced bread. I think many of us suffer that same uh, ailment. And the reality is most of the stocks we pick, they may do well, but they're not going to be a Tesla or an NVIDIA. And so I was round tripping a lot of stocks, uh, much more than I was comfortable with. And so I went back and looked through uh, you know, in the first chapter of the book, there's roughly 103 charts. And I went back and I got historical data on all those stocks. And I looked at them week by week. And you can see it in the book. Most of them don't even close below the 10 week group. They do with, you know, they kind of have a glancing blow and then come right back above it. And based on that, I developed uh, what I call the 10 week rule, which is, uh, you know, as long as the stock's holding the 10 week, then I would try and hold it. And if it had two consecutive closes below the 10 a week, 
then I would move my stop up to either just below those lows or maybe give it a little bit more cushion depending on how much of a gain I have. And mm -hmm. that really helped improve my results because I wasn't round tripping everything thinking that they were all going to go to Pluto. You know, I, I, I was able to lock some in still, you know, after the stock rolls over, but at least I was able to lock in gains at a, at a better level than I historically had. So I think, you know, one of the first uh, stocks that I used those rules on was Palo Alto back in, I think, 2014, 2015. Great. And I definitely want to take a look at that example here soon. But first, before we take a look at it, uh, when you say you have a two week maximum for it closing below the 10 week line, is there a certain percentage below the 10 week line also that is allowable? Or how do you put that into context of how much profit you're you're giving up? How do yeah. those things factor in? So just just to clarify, the stock is allowed to spend more than two weeks under the 10 week. But where I'm drawing the line in the okay, sand is it's once it's the... had two, two closes, then that's the low. Because the chances are if it breaks those lows, then you're probably in for another base. And if you don't have a big enough gain sitting through a base, uh, you're going to give up most of your profits. And what I've settled on is, you know, we'll talk about this in a, in a bit, but basically if by the end of eight weeks, if I don't have a 50% gain, then I'm just going to harvest the gain because if, if the stock even has a, a normal base, 25, 30%, that's going to knock you out, you know, pretty close to break even. And you don't want to take a 50% gain and, and round trip. It's just not good for your psychology. Exactly. And then uh, in that initial uh, period where you you buy a stock, it, you know, it meets your buy criteria, the, the stock checks off all the boxes. How much time do you give it to prove itself? Well, so, you know, I have what I call the prime directive, which is always cut my loss at six percent or less. Um, so obviously that could happen the next day. It may take two or three weeks, but no matter what, we never let our losses grow. And then if it's, if it's working, then I want to try and hold at least eight weeks. So it's a little bit different from Bill's eight week hold rule, because I think that's an absolute where if it, if it does gain that 20 to 25%, you want to hold it eight weeks. Um, and the way I understood it is that even if it came back to the pivot, you would try and Hold no matter what, where what I say is, you know, I'm going to try and hold it eight weeks, but if I've got a, you know, 30, 40% gain, I'm not going to let it go to a, a loss at that point. So I might then end up having to sell it earlier than eight weeks. But if I can, I will hold it eight weeks if it's behaving well. And then at the end of eight weeks, uh, you know, my line in the sand is 50%. If it's not up 50%, then I'm going to harvest my gain at 20 to 25%. If it's already past that, I'll just sell it right there. If it's, you know, 16 or 18% up, then I'll try and get the, the 20 or 25. Uh, but I'm not going to play it like a big leader because it hasn't acted like a big leader. Right. Exactly. Because I mean, a 50% gain in eight weeks, I think we would all love to see even just, even just that. So if that's the minimum threshold, Ajay, for you to keep holding it, I feel like that means that it's got to be a pretty special stock. Yeah, it doesn't, it, you know, they're obviously much rarer, but those are the ones that you want to give the opportunity because, you know, they, they, by definition, if they're in our system, they, they meet the Canson criteria, big sales, big earnings, transformational product or service, and you have a 50% gain in eight weeks. Now you've earned the right to, to be a little bit more patient. Whereas if it's, if it's not up that much, you can't afford to sit through yeah. base. That's that's so true. That makes a lot of sense to me. OK, well, I've, I have several follow up questions for you. Sure. But first, let's go to that Palo Alto example. So P.A.N.W. We have a weekly chart here ending in or, you know, roughly December of 2015. But you can see that beautiful move that the stock went on uh, throughout 2014 and 2015. And we did uh, get a break of the 10 week line 
And how about you talk to us about how this trade unfolded for you from beginning to end? Yeah, absolutely. So this was my first big winner after I had revamped my you know hold rules. So I started buying it out of uh, I think on Market Smith it shows cup and handle, but I had it as a double bottom. Um, let's see if I can. So right in here in spring summer yes, 2014 exactly so i started buying that on the shakeout plus three and then i increased my position on when it broke out of that flat base which was just to the right mm -hmm. and then i was using my 10-week hold rule so the 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 hold rule when it's working you have kind of two ways to get out either you've held it more than a year then the first close below the 10-week you're out or if it has two closes below the 10 week, then you're using, you know, that as your line in the sand. And as it happened, this one, you know, I held for more than a year. And on that week where it had the first close below the 10 week, that's where I sold it. Um, so this, this was, you know, we were in business at that point for just a little bit over a year, year and a half. And this was really transformational in terms of my ability to, to then keep going with the business. Yeah, absolutely. And so what what roughly was the percentage gain here for this one? Uh, I think it was it went up roughly two and a half times. It's hard for me to see on the screen here, but uh, yeah. But for, you yeah. know, from a shakeout plus three entry, you know, somewhere between 64 and 78 and change all, you know, and its highs were roughly about 200. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it was a huge monster move. And there were, you know, besides adding on that flat base, there were a couple of other ads along the way. So, you know, the way Bill taught us is, is you know, when you have something working, try and get a little bit more money into it, which we did. Yeah. So uh, that was going to be one of my follow up questions to you is how do you handle that uh, initial position size? Do you have a standard across the board? Um uh, beginning position size that you use and how do you handle adding on or even a trading around the position? Are you locking any um, into strength or, you know, what about sell signals on that front? So I'm pretty classic, you know, I, my, my full position size is 20%. So I'll buy 10 at the pivot or wherever mm -hmm. I think the action point is. And then another 6%, you know, a couple percent up and then another 4%. So normally if I've done it well, my cost will be roughly one and a half percent above the pivot for my full position. Then after that, depends how the stock evolves. You know, if it gives me a, a, a pullback to the 10 week where, you know, if I'm still within that eight weeks and it hasn't gained 20 to 25%, if it pulls back to the 10 week, I'll add. If it forms another base, I will add. And the amount that I will add depends on what's triggering it. So if it's a new base, I will actually take another 10% on mm. top of that. So, you know, for me, that's a fresh base. And, uh, you know, what I've learned is that, <clears throat> pardon me, most, most big leaders, uh, you know, I was uh, originally I was under the impression that they all climax top. And what I learned is that most big leaders, the way they talk, is that they form a very late stage base, break out, and then drop 8% below the pivot. So if it's a later stage base, that all of a sudden becomes my new stop on my entire position. So I can afford to take, you know, another half position at the breakout because I know my stop on the entire position is just 8% below that pivot. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so here's a look at Palo Alto. We've got another couple of examples, including some Climax Top examples, which we'll we'll get to yes. those too. Uh, but now let's take a look at Square, and this one is from 2017. So talk talk to us about where you entered and added and eventually exited. Yep. So the the place where I first added was during that. Uh, you'll see that big spike on volume just as it was getting to new highs. Uh, and then it starts going a little bit sideways. And I started adding there during that flat base. Great. So this was and, in uh, March of 2017? 
Yeah, it's uh, that should be roughly what around seventeen or eighteen dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, so I built my position up in there, and then it moved up. It formed another flat base, which I didn't buy, but then it pulled back to the ten week, and sort of made that rounding cup. And that's probably yeah, exactly right there. So at that point, I added more to the position, and then uh, my good friend Eric Kroll several years ago he developed. Uh, a checklist for Climax Tops, and there were roughly eight or nine criteria in there. And I added a couple more and I programmed it into Bloomberg so it would automatically send me an alert when something was, uh, you know, potentially experienced a Climax Top. And the way I programmed it was if it hit six out of the 10, that was a Climax Top, or if it hit five out of 10 for two days in a row. And right around Thanksgiving of that year, which are the, you know, the two, two bars near the top, it triggered. And so I sold my position into that Climax top. Um, so you didn't wait for the 10 week rule on this one. No, exactly. So what I had, you know, I haven't had a lot of stocks going to Climax tops, but when I started doing post analysis, I realized there were one or two that I did have that, uh, I mishandled and Palo Alto uh, was not one of them, but LinkedIn may have been one back in the day because it had sort of a, an upper trend line break and some big volume at the end. It's unfortunately, it's no longer on market. So right. it's going to take a look at it. But yeah. after going back and doing that post analysis, I said, this is, this is another tool that, you know, I'm going to steal from Eric and, and <laughs> make it my own. Sharing is caring. It's what Bill yes. did. Right. So. <laughs> Absolutely. So so uh, what, in addition to an upper trend line break, what other signals do you look at for these climactic moves? So some of, some of the criteria would be, uh, and many of them are listed in Bill's book, but it, mm -hmm. you know, it, out of a later stage move, does it move up 25 or 30% in a couple of weeks? Is it more than 100% above the 200 day? Are you getting the heaviest volume? of the move? Are you getting the biggest uh, price gain of the move? Um, you know, none of them are secret. Most yeah. of the signals that Eric looked at were in Bill's book as well. Mm -hmm. And so one or two by themselves is okay. That's a, that's the sign of a powerful leader. But when they start accumulating all on the same day, um, you know, it's kind of the, the time where you're kind of jumping up and down in your chair because you're so excited. And that, that Bloomberg email that comes to me says, okay, stop jumping up and down and start right. selling. Exactly. That's almost like the, the other uh, criteria. Is it, are, are you feeling that euphoria and, ex exactly. and excitement in your uh, account? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This, is so, this is just basically a quantitative way of judging how much euphoria is feeding into your account based on the price action. Absolutely. And so... Another thing that we haven't talked about yet is, are there any sort of um, things that you like to look at on the fundamental side that are like a minimum uh, earnings or revenue growth threshold that you, you got to have? Are you flexible on anything on the fundamental side or how strict are you? Uh, because, I mean, clearly Palo Alto and Square here, uh, these were big winners in these moves that you were in. So how do you how do you filter through to find the cream of the crop? Uh, so I, I am pretty much a classic Kansas uh, trader. So I want at least 20 percent sales and earnings, generally more. Um, and that's not something you're willing to sacrifice then? No, very rarely. If, if it is, it's because it's a turnaround and in the next quarter, they're going to have really big numbers. Got it. Um, I will look at companies that are losing money, but only if they have 50% or more consistent sales growth. Um, they've got, you know, the they've really got to have something that people are lining up to buy, whether it's a, a good or a service. And if they don't, you know, there's there's sixty thousand or pardon me, six thousand stocks. You know, not counting ETFs, that are listed that have some sense of liquidity, um, and there's like fifty nine hundred pygmies jumping up and down saying, "Pick me, pick me," 
And in the back, you've got Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and Will Chamberlain. Like, who are you going to pick? Are you going to pick the four foot two pygmy or are you going to pick Michael Jordan? Yeah. So I think that's our job. If, you know, if we're true to the system is to, to sift through the, the chaff and find uh, what potentially could be a big market. It doesn't mean they will be, but at least, at least they've got fuel in the tank that, that makes it a higher probability. Exactly. Yeah. Those elite stocks. Exactly. Okay. Well, let's move on. We've got a couple more examples that we want to take a look at before we wrap up. And so let's take a look at Tesla and I'm going to set the chart to December of 2021. And this is another stock that had a bit of a climactic move here. I'm also going to change the price scale to best fit. So we can see the big move here. So Ajay, where were you first getting into Tesla for the move that we want to discuss today? So, you know, on and off through the past 10 years, uh, we've traded Tesla. On this particular move, I was very late. So I got in what looks like, it's not quite a high tech flag, but it's got the, the last sort of consolidation prior to the January 21 top. Um, I think uh, at the time it was trading around 400. I don't know what it will show on your chart here. So let's um, see here. So, okay. So was it this this sort of flag structure uh, here and here that you were buying out of? The next one. The next one. Okay. Yeah. So, so I was here. buying. Yeah, exactly. On that downtrend okay. line. That's exactly where I was buying. So I was quite Great. late into this move. Um and then this was one of the few. So if in eight weeks, it was up more than 50%, but literally on that last up bar, which I think is the week of January 8th, mm -hmm. uh, it set off the climax top sell rules. And you know, eight weeks out of a base generally isn't a climax top, but when you look at a stock that's, you know, I think at the lows there, it's roughly $40 and it's gone to, 800. Um, you know, I can hear Bill saying, how much more do you want out of the stock? So yeah. I, I did sell my position into that week because it, it was triggering quantitatively what I viewed as a climax top. Yeah, uh, right exactly. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then it did, you know, unlike most climax tops, this one didn't totally fall apart. It did have a deep correction, but it actually set up and went on to make one more all time high. Uh, which we didn't participate in, but, you know, sometimes they do come back. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, then it had another, um, you know, brief burst yeah. uh, and and peaked along with the broad market in, yes. in November yeah. of 2021. Yeah. So, yeah, great explanation there. And then last but not least, BNTX Beyond Tech. This was another big winner in the you know 2020 2021 area and i think i can see the climactic area for this one aj in August. yeah yeah this one was interesting so in that uh the base that formed earlier that year roughly around march when it broke out at that time uh yeah out of that base i bought moderna roughly the same time that this was breaking out and i took my gains in moderna and then both uh, started to set up again. And this one looked like it was setting up a high tight flag. So even though you know I thought the move was done, I decided to try it again. And this one, I think it was only three or four weeks. Um, so I did sell it early instead of trying to hold it eight, but it, it definitely looked like a climax top. And it had made, again, like the previous example in Tesla, it had made a giant move from its IPO. Um, and there were quite a few stocks that were either, you know, quantitatively they were setting a climax top or they looked very toppy around that mm -hmm. same time, which got, got me a little bit uh, cautious. Yeah. So some more clues there into what action to take. And so now we're in a totally different market, right? <laughs> so what are your thoughts on what you're looking for in that next batch of leaders does it feel like 
we're we're starting to see that fresh leadership brewing underneath the the surface is it still too early to tell what's your sense there's a few um so you know on holdings which a lot of people have been looking at uh has displayed some good power you know it's still well below the left side high of the base but it's acting very constructive uh first solar is acting powerfully and that's that looks like a potential turnaround based on the estimates they're going to have good numbers this year and next year. Um, you know, the, the real challenge is that most of the IPOs that came out in 2020 or 2021, yeah. uh, most of, of them got destroyed. <laughs> yeah. And so for them to be leadership, we need to have a little bit more time away from the left side of the base, uh, just so that overhead gets stale. Uh, or you know, if this is similar to, you know, call it 88 to 90, then maybe it's going to be the old leaders that come back. And if that's the case, then potentially this bull market might be, you know, when we get it, it may be a little bit more halting because there isn't that fresh merchandise, right? When there's, when there's fresh merchandise, then, you know, when you see a move like that in on holdings, it's because institutions had it. Uh, pegged as a certain type of stock, and then they realized, holy cow, this thing yeah. is something a little bit different. And that's, you don't see gaps up of 40, 50% unless the elephants in the room are going in and stampeding, not with a stock of this liquidity. So they they thought it was one type of stock, and now they realize it's something maybe a little bit better. And so they all pile in at the same time. That's where you see that type of volume. So there are a few like this, but most of them, you know, kind of look like on did five or six weeks ago. They're still way low in the base. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll have to see if on can really turn into one of those next big winners that we'll have to use the, the 10 week rule or the climax top rule yeah. uh, after we all are just, you know, making so much money in it. If it, if it <laughs> uh, can pull back here and maybe form, form another base we'll have it may, it may need another base it's possible need, yeah may need another base we'll yeah. we'll have to see about that but then in closing ajay i think it might be useful for our audience um to hear a little bit about um from you because clearly you have studied can slim but you've also done your own studies and that's really given you an edge so for traders out there who uh, maybe or they're still trying to find uh, what type of trader they are or their edge. What would be your advice? I think that's that would exactly be my advice. Do do your own work. Verify for yourself what Bill showed to work, um, or find something that is maybe different, but it works for you. The, the reality is that canceling is not the only way to make money in the stock market. It's just one way. Uh, there are many other ways that can work and you need to find something that fits your personality that you believe in because in a year like 2022 or 2023, if you don't believe in what you're doing, then the, that's when the market is going to find you and, and kind of press your buttons. So, but if you do believe in it, then you, you know, you have the ability to, to come back from the inevitable uh, setbacks that you're going to have along the way, you know? None of us ever solve the market. Uh, we just try and find a way to work within what the market is offering us. Absolutely. Well, well, with your track record at Single A, we are definitely very fortunate to have your insights today and uh, sharing at, sharing with us some of the tools in your toolbox for success. So thank you so much for your time, Ajay. It's, it's been my pleasure. And again, thank you for having me on and congratulations on your promotion. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks so much, everyone, for watching. Hope you enjoyed Trader Tales. And we'll see you back here next time.